This is the Bates Bobcast, our weekly podcast where we take a look at the week that was in Bates Athletics. My name is Aaron Morse, and this week we're talking with Bates lecturer Chris Petrella and student body president at Adire Facariti about the Martin Luther King Day panel, Rethinking Reparations, Bending the Arc of Athletics Toward Justice. We also recap another CBV series title for the swimming and diving programs and take a look at where our basketball teams stand. All that and more coming up on the Bates Bobcast. The men's basketball team welcomed Hamilton to town on Friday night in a battle of a pair of 2-0 teams in the NESCAC. And the Bobcats prevailed 83-78 behind double doubles from seniors Marcus and Malcolm Del Pesh. First year Jeff Spellman poured in a career-high 16 points off the bench, making some spectacular shots along the way. He knocked down the three earlier. Hesitation move all the way to the hoop. That's a tough shot. It goes in. Oh, what an acrobatic play by Spellman. And the Bobcats lead 29-20. Gilpin ahead to Spellman. Spellman off balance. Scored in the foul. Oh, my. What a drive by Spellman. And he gets the bucket. My goodness. And the Bobcats lead by 10. After the game, we caught up with head coach John Furbush. One guy who obviously had a big game was uh, Jeff Spellman, uh, first year coming off the bench. I mean, he's been hurt half the season, so what's it like to have him back and healthy? He changes us. I mean, he, he's, he's able to create his own shot, create shots for other guys. I think his, he's got great elevation in his jump shot, so it's just another weapon that really we haven't showcased yet, and I think that moving forward, he should be a problem for some other teams. And then Nick Gilpin, another really balanced performance. He almost had a triple-double. He had six points, I think ten rebounds, nine assists. I mean, what, he, he seems to, like cool under pressure, right? Nothing bothers him. No, he's, he's, he's just got stone cold, <laughs> just ice in his veins. And he's, uh, he threw a couple lazy passes that were questionable. That we, we'll, Again, we'll watch that on the tape and correct those. But, I, yeah, for the most part, when you have a freshman that you know, does those things, I mean, we're going to be pretty good. One guy I found entertaining was Max Eaton coming off the bench, knocking down a couple threes, especially there, knocking down that three in the second half. He was hyped up, it seemed like, right? He's a <laughs> major energy guy for us <laughs> on both sides of the ball. Yeah. You know, he's just so engaged, and, and I think it's infectious to the other guys. So, yeah, he's, he's playing a huge role for us. He kind of changes the element of our post play because he can stretch the floor, hit threes, but he can still guard down low. So we're going to need him tomorrow because this was a fast-paced game. Marcus and Malcolm logged a lot of minutes. But at the end of the day, they can rest next year. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we'll, they'll wake up and be fine. All right, Coach, thanks so much. Thank you, Aaron. Although the Bobcats fell the next day to number 15, nationally ranked Middlebury by a score of 79-71, to 71, Spellman was excellent yet again, scoring a team-high 14 points all in the second half. For his efforts, Spellman is our male Bobcat of the week. I mean, it must be exciting for you after a long layoff from basketball basically to really get back out there and play, right? Yeah, no, it's extremely exciting. Uh, obviously, I'm not playing last year, and then coming into this year and being all excited and ready to go and then getting injured was a tough blow, but, you know, it's super exciting to be back. And I just, you know, I'm really happy and can't wait to go on. Yeah, and you took a gap year, so you were going to go play somewhere else, decided not to. So took a year off from basketball, basically. What was that year off like? What Were you, were you working on your game by yourself? Yeah, it was pretty much just me and Jim alone. I mean, it was... Uh, it was tough, but, you know, it, it definitely uh, allowed me to realize that, you know, the, the basketball is something that I really want to continue to do, and, uh, you know, it was it was a difficult time, but, you know, I feel like it makes me a lot stronger now, and just, you know, having that whole time to work out, you know, obviously helped, but it was tough not, you know, being part of a team at the time. And then what prompted you to uh, get to Bates? What led you to Bates? Well, I'd always known about Bates in the past. I just wasn't a, I don't know, for some, for you know, one reason or another, I, I didn't think it was an option for me at the time. And then, you know, I just con- uh, decided to pursue it last year during this gap year and realized that, you know, this is the place I wanted to be. I just went after it, and luckily it worked out. And how much fun are you having now, getting able to play, getting able to play against some NESCAC opponents, and getting a 3-1 start to NESCAC play? Yeah, no, it's... 
it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. I wasn't really entirely sure what to, you know, uh, expect, but now now being in it, it's you know, it's great. I love it. It's, I mean, going three and one right now. I just I think I think we have a really good team. I think that we can just continue to do well, and you know, it's nice to be seeing how the school is responding. You know, everyone seems to really enjoy the team, and you know, it's something that I just you know, I'm really looking forward to be a part of for the next four years. And then so far, at least, and this could change, but Coach Furbos is using you as like a spark off the bench somewhat, yeah. and especially second half against Middlebury. All 14 your points were there in the second half. Uh, do you embrace that role of being like the spark off the bench there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, it's something that's like kind of new to me. I've never really had to do it. Um, but, yeah, anything Coach Furbos wants me to do, I'm going to go out there and do it, you know, regardless of if I'm in the starting lineup or coming off the bench or playing two minutes. You know, I just want to go out there and just make an impact, and whatever that, whatever that is, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Sure, absolutely. And then um, your style of play, very exciting, I think. I mean, some off-balance shots. Uh, you seem to be able to create some separation in the lane. Where would you learn how to do that? Because it seems very difficult, but you make those shots. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it's obviously a lot of hours in the gym alone, but there's also probably a lot of one-on-one one on one and, uh, you know, playing with some guys who are bigger, stronger, maybe a little bit quicker than yourself. you got to kind of – figure out a way to get the get the ball up there and I guess over the years I've just developed a, you know a little a little extra talent to get that ball around and up over the opponent yeah and it seems like you really feed off the crowd too uh, against Hamilton and I saw you pull up for that jumper and then kind of like look over at the crowd and what was that moment like yeah no it, it's just exciting it's it's nice to play in front of the, the packed house like that uh you know especially being out for the year so you kind of forget what that feeling is like and now just being back in, it's like I feel like I haven't even missed a beat. So it's just, you know, I like obviously playing in alumni is it's amazing. I mean, it's something like I haven't experienced before, and I just it's, it gets overwhelming and it just kind of takes over in the moment. You don't really even remember what happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then going forward, where's where's the team been discussing about you know goals going forward? Obviously, because you know tough loss to Middlebury, but a game that you know guys you guys were in it basically yeah. the whole time. So what's been sort of the focus now going forward? Yeah, well, I mean, we think we have a really good team. We've we've thought that from day one. Um, you know, obviously, dropping the game to Middlebury was tough, but we think we kind of, you know, a lot of teams say you get better as the season goes on, but we really feel that. We really feel that that's how our season is going. And so, you know, we're not looking at that loss like, uh, you know, we, it's as a down point. We, it's, it's, it's ultimately, you know, we thought we were right in that game. We think that we can beat any team in the NESCAC. You know, that's just how we're viewing the season. You know, this is, we want to continue to win. I know that's how I view it. I want to, you know, play in the tournament and keep going and just make a run. And I think we have the uh, components to do that, and I think we will continue to do that. All right, great. Well, two more home games coming up this weekend. Jeff Spellman, our male Bobcat of the Week. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The women's basketball team knocked off Hamilton 60-44 to on Friday behind 22 points from Ali Capola. Capola followed that up with a career-high 27 points the very next day, but Bates fell on the road to Middlebury, 66-46. to We talked with head coach Allison Montgomery about the weekend. Obviously, road trips are never easy, especially when you have to go all the way to Hamilton, yeah. but you came away with a victory. What was so key to, uh, to beating the Continentals on the road? It looked like the defense played great. Yeah, we played good defense. I thought we brought um, good energy. Um, we're just really determined that game. So, And I think, you know, just... Um, we built a nice little lead there, and they battled back, and then I think just finished the game really well. I think we just had everybody um, on the court um, just leading and playing hard and pretty determined to get that win. Yeah. And it was like Allie, I mean, she had another great game, both the games over the weekend. Uh, what's been working so well for her? Her scoring is really increasing, I feel like. Yeah, I really honestly feel like it's just her mindset. I mean, I'm probably a lot of coaches would agree with me, but I'm a coach who believes that like um, just performing, performing the way she's performing has so much to do with your mindset. Um, you know, of course, you got to have some ability too, but she's had that ability. I think she's just really, especially the second half of the season, um, just taking a kind of a refuse to lose kind of attitude, really determined, wants to make the most of this last stretch of her career. Um, so yeah, I think she's a player who's always had that ability. I think she's just. Um, stop second guessing herself and kind of put the team on her back in that way. And I think she just she's really determined. And after the win over Hamilton, the Middlebury game the next day, a long road trip to get there, about four hour yeah. drive through some back roads. But 
you know, a game where it looked like just a couple quarters, first quarter, fourth quarter, it, it just seemed like Middlebury kind of had control in those particular quarters, which made the difference. Do you break it down like that? Do you look at, okay, if we can just, like, each quarter, you know, keep it reasonable at least, right? Yeah, just, I mean, we're talking a lot about just consistency um, and a lot of things. I think both those intangibles, which I just touched on with Allie, which she's been so consistent about, but I think as a team, um, our mindset and our energy – and our leadership and all those things have to be really, really consistent. And I think if we can do all those things consistently, then your play becomes just naturally much more consistent. Um, so I think, yeah, we just had really some real lapses um, in our confidence and in that energy um, during that game. And you just, I mean, you can't do that in any game, but definitely not against a good team on the road who's playing well. So, um, yeah, I think I think all of those things got to be there first. And then, you know, like I said, I think the actual, like, performing part and being able to put the ball in the basket and get stops, those things happen um, when you have the right approach to the game. You update us, uh, update us on some of the first years who have been getting yeah. some minutes. You know, you we've seen Carly Christoffi out there. We've seen Melanie Bancourt since she returned from her injury. Yeah. What's their progress been like so far? Yeah, great. I think, I mean, you know, with Carly is playing a huge role as a freshman and I think, um, you know, is learning a lot as a freshman and getting a lot of good game experience. And so I think, yeah, she's been she's been steady. She's definitely a freshman, like I said, working through those things, especially at the point guard spot where she's playing a lot of minutes. Um, and, yeah, Mel is just, um, you know, she's had a huge impact, I think, for us, not just, you know, whether she's scoring the basketball or not. I think she just brings great energy and has a good basketball IQ and plays hard. But, um, yeah, we, you know, this that's going to be a process, too, because, I mean, she's really – we have to ease her in um, after being off the court for so long. But, yeah. Looking at, you know, some of the other more experienced players, I mean, Burnett Connors, I see dishing out some assists, yeah. you know, chipping in points. Uh, what are you looking for for maybe, like, you know, Burnett and Nina to maybe provide, like, a, a you know, two more scoring options, really, because yeah. it's been a lot of alley recently. Yeah, it really has, and I think definitely at Middlebury you saw that, like, she was the only kid who was really scoring. And so what I just touched on with those those things around consistency um, – and again, I think if all those intangibles are there, then the stat line shows it too. And um, I think both Bernie and Nina have really stepped up and proved in this last stretch with those things where we've had a little more success. Um, but yeah, I think we, we definitely have to have more than just Allie doing that all the time. So um, yeah, the more and, you know, particularly in those out of those two who have been most reliable in terms of producing points. So. We got a trip to Connecticut this weekend with yeah. Connecticut College and Wesleyan. What do you know about them? Um, but they're in the NESCAC, so they're <laughs> gonna, they're going to battle. Um, you know, just a good conference. I think Con College is a really really talented team, like player for player. They've had some ups and downs um, this year, where they've just I think probably struggling with some of the things I just talked about in terms of consistency. Um, so, and they've had a tough stretch to start. NESCAC in terms of the opponents that they've played and so they've been a little bit up and down but their overall record is really good um they are really talented and like you said it's on the road so that'll be tough and same with Wesleyan like at a conference they um have played great and they have some really good pieces and so um you know and I think I think when you get into conference play like it's just you know no one's safe <laughs> you know any any opponent is um is going to be tough so yeah these are this is a big road trip for us with practices this week leading up to the road trip, what's do you do you change your points of emphasis based on the previous games, or is it pretty much consistency consistent in terms of the, the way the practices go? Yeah, it's pretty consistent. I mean, I believe in really focusing on like what we have to focus on, and you know, taking the weekend before to to really sort of improve. Um, the things that we didn't do well. Um, but, of course, some of that also does include, you know, preparing for specific opponents, um, whether that's changing the defense that we're going to be playing mostly or um, just, you know, player-specific tendencies or those things. But, yeah, so there will be some focus um, specifically on our opponents, but particularly kind of the next couple of days we'll be addressing some things we got to improve on as a team. All right, Coach, thanks so much. Thanks, Aaron. It was a very exciting weekend for the men's and women's swimming teams. The Bobcats swept Bowden and Colby for the third consecutive season, taking down the Polar Bears on Friday at Tarbell Pool and defeating the Mules in Waterville on Saturday. Friday's meet was particularly dramatic. The women's team defeated Bowden 154-145. They needed to win the 400-yard freestyle relay, the final event of the day, to win the meet. And the Bobcat team of Monica Sears, Logan McGill, Hannah Johnson, and Sarah DeHare did exactly that. Their time of 337.73 set a new Tarbell Pool record. 
Sears also broke the Tarbell Pool record in the 1,000-yard freestyle, and she emerged victorious in the 500 free. The first year followed that up with another win in the 500 free the very next day against Colby. For her record-breaking performances, Monica Sears is our female Bobcat of the Week. I definitely came into freshman year, like, I definitely wanted something on the boards, on the record boards, either pool time or a team time. And so to kind of have that achieved before NESCAX kind of gives me a really positive outlook to, like, how well I'm going to compete all tapered and suited up. Yeah, and then the last event of the Bowdoin meet was a relay race that you were leading off, and you knew going in you had to win it. So what was going through your mind? I mean... When it comes to that, you just kind of want to compete, like, just show what you've been training for. You know, sometimes emotions can get in the way and it can psych you out. But at that time, it was the end of the meet. You just kind of want to just leave it all in the pool. So, you know, I was ready to to do that. I had already swum a bunch of other really long events. So I knew I just had to, whatever I had left, I had to empty the tank and I did, so I'm, I'm really happy about that. And I know Sarah DeHare, part of that relay team, a senior. She had just raced, though, and so how does that change things? You need to, I mean, she was going to be pretty tired, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the whole dual meet is just a part of the training process. When we get to NESCACs, sometimes you're going to be swimming back-to-back events, so if you know how to swim at your very best, at your very fastest, when you're that tired, that just makes you one up against the competitions. That's what makes it so important to be able to just come up, step up behind the blocks and be, I'm, just say I'm ready. Absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about your background. You're a first year. Uh, How did you end up deciding to come to Bates here for college? Uh, well, I've been swimming, I've been doing club swimming for 13 years. And I knew I didn't really want to go D1 because I didn't want to have swimming as a job. And I was looking at Bowdoin and Colby, and in the off chance, someone just happened to say, oh, you should look at Bates. And when I came here, you know, it was the academics were what I was looking for. The swimming was what I was looking for. And it was also just the people that just made the whole experience, like, complete for me. And after my very first college tour, it was the second college tour I had ever gone on. And I was like, I want to go here. Like, this is the place for me. And so you probably already knew about the big rivalry between Colby, Bates, and Bowdoin, right? Not a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm from California, so uh, it's like I'm just kind of out of that whole loop. But definitely when coming here, you could tell that, the like, the competitiveness was real. So. Well, you're from California, so how do you even, like, be alerted to the fact that there's these three schools up in Maine that all have pretty good swimming programs? Um, my brother looked at them. Okay. And my dad also has family. He's from Massachusetts, so I've. That's why I kind of looked at colleges in the New England area because, you know, it's not too far from family, mm-hmm. and I don't know. I wanted something new from California, so. And you don't mind the winters here? No, I love. I'm so happy in the winter. Yeah. I I love the cold weather. Everyone's like, "How oh, are you so insane for leaving California?" And I'm like. I'm happy when it's three degrees outside. I'm walking out and I'm like, it's snowing. Like, <laughs> I'm I'm just a happy person in cold weather. <laughs> All right, well there you go. And then um, so far this year, what's been maybe a biggest adjustment perhaps for you uh, from high school and club swimming to now college? I think one of my favorite things is just being on a team where every single person is completely invested, like in the swimming. You know, sometimes you can get a couple people here and there that might not be or be a little bit on the fence. But, you know, to have 50-something people who are 100% in it to win it, it's it's just the attitude that is so encouraging to, like, just go for it. You know, everyone's supporting each other, and it's just a great community to thrive in. And in the pool, what are you working on as a first year to try to grow your swimming, you know, maybe events in terms of, you know, what you're looking to build on? Um, I'm mostly working on my endurance. Uh, it's a very core aspect if I'm going to be swimming the 1,000 and 500. But, um, you know, I also need to work on some of my fast-paced stuff, you know, mm-hmm. quick twitch and all of that. It's the little details. Yeah. So, Yeah. Great, and then um, what have the maybe the upperclassmen told you about NESCAX and maybe or maybe Coach Casares even coming up? Because I know you have one more meet before NESCAX, but then obviously NESCAX is where it's all going to come together, hopefully. Everyone can only say so much because 
when you go to a really big meet, it's like it's just all about the experience and you know, I've been to like really big meets. I haven't been to a meet where it's like only girls, so mm. I've heard it's like a very different feeling from the men's NESCACs. So I mean, I'm just excited. You know, that's what they tell you. Just be excited and I'm ready to go and experience something new. All right, Monica, thanks so much for your time. Congrats on being our female Bobcat of the Week. Yeah, thank you. The squash teams went undefeated at home over the weekend. The men took down Hobart and Hamilton on Saturday by 9 to nothing scores, and the women also defeated Hamilton 9 to nothing. Both teams celebrated their respective seniors on Saturday at the Squash Center, and we chatted with women's co-captains Emma Dunn and Charlotte Cabot. Charlotte, we'll start with you. Your family was there. Uh, how cool was that? I know the Cabots have a long history of uh, play, uh, bait squash players and captains for that matter. Yeah, it was great to have them there. Um, my parents both made the trip, and my sister and her fiancé and their dog, and my dog as well, we were all there, so it was great um, to see them. They're always so supportive, and it was great to have them there for Senior Day. And then Emma, I saw that you and Charlotte got a bunch of uh, interesting gifts from Blair and the rest of the team, and so I saw there was some laughter there. What were some of the gifts, and what was so funny behind it? Maybe. Well, it's been a running joke since our freshman year that I've always been team mom. Like, I always have Band-Aids like Advil, anything that you possibly need before during a match. And so I got a fanny pack in order to have all of those lovely accessories easily handable. So it was pretty great. Nice. And what gifts did you get? Um, one that I got was a mix, like an old school, I think it was like 60s CD. Um, and it was because I always listened to the same song on repeat before like the whole season of all my matches. So it was to give me a little bit of variety. <laughs> there you go. And then uh, Emma, for senior day, obviously a 9 nothing win over Hamilton. Uh, obviously the previous weekend kind of tough. So how nice was it to bounce back with a 9 nothing win like that on senior day? No, it was great. I mean, it definitely kind of shows that we need to keep our momentum going and to have everybody win 3-0-2 is awesome. And I think that's a huge confidence booster for the team, especially since we have some really tough matches coming up this weekend that we need to win. Right, Franklin and Marshall coming up uh, this weekend uh, at Amherst, right? Yeah, exactly. We um, are really excited and getting really prepared. We had a 5:45 a.m. practice this morning because it's an early match this weekend, so we're getting ready, um, training hard, and I think we're all very excited. Okay, 5:45 a.m. practice, Emma. How common is this? <laughs> Not necessarily that early, but um, in the past we'd normally do like 6 a.m., 6:30 track workouts. But this is the first time in our um, four years here that we've actually gone to the courts as a morning practice, which actually was really fun because we got to be in our own space and do the types of workouts that we need to do to prepare. Great. And then, Charlotte, um, obviously you two are seniors, but there's a lot of talent at first years and sophomores. How excited are you two to see that uh, for the future of this program? I mean, obviously this year a lot of matches left, but also the future looking towards that. Yeah, I'm so excited. They're great girls, and their future is extremely bright. Um, and I can't wait to watch from the sidelines after we graduate. <laughs> I mean, what have you noticed from some of the younger players? They have just so much talent and so much drive to compete and to win and to literally just give everything that they have and leave it out there on the court. And at the end of the day, that's what it means to fight like a bobcat. And that's all that Charlotte and I could ever ask for. Great. Well, we're looking forward to this weekend at Amherst to take on Franklin and Marshall and Amherst. Charlotte, Emma, thanks so much. Thank you. The track and field teams took on MIT and Colby over the weekend. On the women's side, junior Sally Cisse and senior captain Allison Hill won two events apiece, with Cisse winning the 60-meter dash and the triple jump, and Hill winning the 200-meter dash and the 60-meter hurdles. Meanwhile, first-year Paige Rabb won the 400-meter dash. The Bobcats finished second in the meet, behind MIT and ahead of Colby. We caught up with Cisse to discuss the first meet of the indoor season. Well, I was really excited for this meet. It's always a a good time competing against MIT. They're so energetic, so excited. Um, they're so competitive. So, you know, they allow you to push yourself without um, expecting too much and feeling down about yourself at, like, with any result you have. So it was just a lot of fun. It was just a lot of fun. You mentioned your All-American status in the triple jump, but you're also now going to be adding a couple more events more this year. Tell us about these two new events, or somewhat new events at least for you. Um, well, um, yeah, so as you stated, I did focus on triple jump my first two years here, but this year I'm going to be adding a little mix to it. I'm going to be uh, 
taking a, a sprinting a little bit more serious, like in the 60 meter dash, and then I'm going to be adding a long jump to my resume. Um, I think it should be a good year. Um, it's fun adding a little mix to it and having something to look forward to and expect at track meets. You know, normally I'm just, I attend track meets and I'm just like focused on the triple jump and that's my only thing, but I like the variety in it and I like being able to add um, sprint mechanics to it because to be able to be a good triple jumper, I also have to be a really good sprinter. So like, I'm happy to be able to like dive into that as well. And you won the 60 meter dash there at the meet, right? So um, how cool was that for you? Wow, okay, I did not expect that going into this race. Like, I ran the 60 meter dash last year. Um, my time was, I guess, something you'd say, like, okay or decent, but, well, like, I didn't expect that at all. Like, it, it was so surprising, but the race felt good. I'm excited to, like, keep improving and get better at it. So, like, yeah, it should be fun. And then the long jump obviously presents unique challenges as well. I mean, it's obviously very different from the triple jump. So what are the unique challenges of the long jump? Uh, well, I even um, well even in the meet, I struggled a little bit with transitioning from triple jump to long jump. So with triple jump, you want to jump as far out horizontally as you can, and with long jump, you want to jump as high up as you can. So like even in my warm ups and like even my first few jumps, getting into it, I found myself in um, triple jump. Even like as much as I've been doing it, I found myself jumping up because I'm like now learning to long jump, and I've been spending more time jumping up so I can get used to that. So it's going to be a challenge, but it, it'll be also fun trying to, like, balance the two. Yeah, guys, the muscle memory is completely different. It's completely different, but, yeah, it's completely different. <laughs> it should be fun. I'm excited about it. Are there any, like, sprinters or other people who have done the long jump that you've been talking with about, you know, key success? Yes, every, oh, my gosh. So, like, if you ask Shushi, she'll tell you, like, between every little jump, I, like, I'm, like, running up to her. I'm, like, Shushi, like, did I do it right? Was my knee high enough? Because, you know, she, I, like, call her, like, the long jump queen. Like, she's amazing at it. And, like, I'm just, like, looking up to her and, like, having her, like, literally, like, sh sh um, show me each step of the way, like, where, what I should be doing, how I should be feeling. So, yeah. This weekend, hosting a meet, the Bates Invitational. I know you hosted the same meet uh, last year. So what's the experience like to be home and having all the competition coming to you? I love being home. One, I like hate traveling. I hate, I hate the bus rides. But I love being home because it's a different energy. You know, like, it's your home, like, your home field. You know what you're doing. You know, like, I know exactly, like, where in my race like what I should be doing at each race because I know, okay, at this mark, I should be going this distance because I've been practicing it for like years now. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited for to have all my friends here cheering me on. Like it'd be so excited. Like even now they're texting me like, oh, when do you, like, what are you running? Like, what are you jumping? Like what time? Like I'm going to be there. Like they're like talking about making signs and everything. It's just, <laughs> I'm just so excited. It should be fun. That should be really fun. Well, Sally, thanks so much for joining us here on the Bobcast. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. The men's track and field team also finished behind MIT and ahead of Colby in their meet. The Bobcats won six events, including junior Adedire Fakaridi taking home the top spot in the shot put and the weight throw. Then on Monday, Fakaridi, who is the Bates student body president, participated in the MLK Day panel, Rethinking Reparations, Bending the Arc of Athletics Toward Justice. We talked with Fakaridi after the panel. First of all, Martin Luther King Day here at Bates. You were just on a panel, a really interesting discussion about student athletes and you know financial resources, whether they should be paid or not, whether they should be unionized or not at the Division One level. Obviously, you're D three athletes. What you bring new, unique perspective, though. I thought, what's the main thing you got out of this discussion? You think? Well, I really, I really felt really privileged um, by like not having to go through the many injustices that um, some top end. Um, D D1 athletes um, kind of experience, given that like I can actually focus on my course load and not necessarily focus on track and field. And um, Amir, that was on our panel, brought to light his experience as a D1 athlete. And I, after all, after through through the panel, I, I realized how privileged I, I was to decide to go to a D3 school and still have the opportunity to perform at a high level um, and athletically, and also take rigor, um, academically rigorous courses. So. I thought an interesting thing you said is you have no desire to ever try to even be an Olympian. Why is that? Because, I mean, to be completely honest, as a young child, my, my dad has always instilled upon me the importance of the brain. And he always told me that, like, your body, your body is, is physical, it gets old and it wears out, but your brain, you can always go to the library and read and whatnot. So even if I was in a position to, to like, a, achieve excellence to the point of the Olympics, I, I have no desire to do that because I understand that there's much more potential if I'm to exercise my brain with that same rigor. 
All right, now that being said, let's talk about the track meet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, the first indoor meet of the year. Yeah. Uh, how do you think it went down there at MIT? Uh, I, I thought the team as, as a whole did really well. We got second to uh, MIT, which is a very strong team. Um, they, they win almost every award every year, nationally, domestic, <laughs> whatnot. So I think uh, um, the men as, as a whole did very well, and I'm very proud of them. So You had a great start, a couple of wins. Uh, tell us about the events you participated in down there. I participated in the shot put and the weight. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought that um, I, it, was a, it was a pretty okay start in the shot put. Not exactly where I want to be in the weight, but um, in terms of just getting comfortable with the nerves of competing again, I'm very excited moving forward. The shot put, I know, and obviously Nick was kind of your mentor in that. He's graduated, so what, who, do you, who are you looking to now? Uh, you know what? I'm still looking to Nick. Uh, <laughs> I'm still talking to him every now and then. Uh, Pless actually called me 1.30 a.m. that night to, t- to talk to me about, uh, to break down analysis about how I was feeling. So it was definitely very, very good to still have that support, like kind of forefathers or ghosts in the past kind of giving me advice and whatnot. And then the weight throw, obviously, that was where you were an indoor All-American mm-hmm. last year. And so, uh, what, I mean, you, you obviously want to get back to nationals. You said you're not quite where you are to yet. What are you working on there? Oh, honestly, it's just comfort. Um, in practice, I look completely different from um, uh, the competition in a sense that, like, the nerves definitely got the best, better end of me. I was essentially just uh, muscling it out there. I didn't execute my uh, technique to the same degree that I did um, in practice. So that's really, that's really the main thing I'm working on now, just figuring out that right level of excitement to perform. At. Well, it must be nice to even even though you're you're not satisfied yet, you still won the event. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> honestly, yeah, it is it is it is good. But like, it, it took a lot of work over the summer. That's all I dedicated my time to. So, all right, well, D-Ray, thanks so much for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Aaron. Bates lecturer and former Bobcat track and field athlete Chris Petrella led the panel on Monday. It also featured Erica Rand, the White House Professor of Art and Visual Culture, who writes on gender and pop culture. Title IX officer Gwen Lexow head lacrosse coach Peter Lasagna, and Amir Loggins, a doctoral candidate in African-American studies at Cal Berkeley. It was the conclusion of a very busy weekend for Petrella. We were able to connect with him over the phone on Tuesday to discuss racial justice and college athletics. First of all, where did the idea for this panel uh, come from? Most of the credit really needs to go to athletics director Kevin McHugh. He, he approached me probably about... Um, uh, two months before uh, Dr. King, the Dr. King observance and indicated his uh, deep interest in putting together a panel um, on reparations. And then we sort of wrestled with how best to connect uh, this sort of current political moment in college athletics, D1 or otherwise, with the general theme um, of reparations. And so um, – we decided that we would use reparations as a framework and an entryway through which we could ask larger questions pertaining to uh, the arc of social justice, if you will, in uh, in college athletics. Yeah, in college athletics, we were talking about during the panel, of course, the big time Division One athletes, football, basketball, they generate so much revenue with barely any return. I mean, I know um, Amir compared it to kind of like a, a plantation mentality almost or a plantation setup, if you will, between the administrators and um, the athletes. What are your thoughts on that? I think on its most basic level, it's certainly a deeply regressive redistributive uh, paradigm, right? Because those who are creating the product, that is to say the laborers, the athletes, um, rarely see the fruits of um, their 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 hard work vis-a-vis financial re- remuneration. So, um, I think there are some parallels that certainly can be made um, uh, to the plantation model. I think Amir also mentioned the sharecropping model, which I think is probably a more accurate descriptor um, when thinking about the ways in which uh, African Americans uh, in the post Reconstruction period. Um, were uh, essentially obligated to work on land that was more or less leased, right, and then had to pay back um, many of the uh, debts that they incurred through leasing, right, which basically uh, prevented them from um, seeing the full fruits um, of their of their labor. And we mentioned that this is it's very specific, obviously, to you know football and basketball at the major Division One programs, but Division Three. It's impacted by this model as well, right? Yeah, that's right. Because what we, you know, what we know is uh, Division One, and particularly 
um, football and men's basketball within Division One, which, of course, statistically and numerically are dominated by black and brown athletes and even more precisely black athletes, um, many of the funds that are generated through D1 a- uh, athletics um, trickle down to D2 and D3 athletics in order to fund uh, our programs. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, infinitesimal uh, proportion, but it's still very relevant because Division Three athletics, to some degree, people could argue, is sort of the, the terminus of um, the, the, the flow of cash, right, coming from Division One. On the panel, we had a Division Three athlete and D. Ray Faccaridi, student body president here at Bates, and a, a, a track and field star for the, for the Bobcats. And how cool was that to hear his perspective? Kind of right. It was kind of interesting to hear from a, a D three athlete about what he thinks of the D one system because he was talking about how he wouldn't want to be D one because of how much time commitments involved there. He did a, a really fantastic job on on the panel yesterday and tried to draw out some of these more subterranean linkages between D one and D three. Uh, and also, um, you know, I think push back against this notion that many high-performing uh, high school athletes necessarily want to aspire um, to Division I. Uh, so I, I understand that. I also understand it on a fairly intimate perspective because I ran cross-country and track when I was a student uh, at Bates um, mm-hmm. and, you know, was, was quite good in, in high school and uh, never particularly – uh, was looking to pursue um, an athletic career in, in, in D1 sport for the very reason that D. Ray um, articulated. And then, Chris, I was curious about your thoughts on, you know, progress being made in this arena of Division One athletes, you know, down the road, hopefully maybe being compensated for their efforts beyond the scholarship and whatnot. I know, obviously, the Big Ten recently announced that they were going to be doing, you know, guaranteed four-year scholarships, which has been a, a problem before because before people could just take scholarships away. But that's that's a step in the right direction. That's probably not enough in your opinion, right? That's right, but it is. I mean, I think it's important. It is important, of course, to acknowledge where good work and progress is being made and done. Uh, and I think the Big Ten did recently take a step in, in the right direction um, in a lot of ways, um, the decision to grant four-year athletic scholarships evidences the the, the conference's uh, commitment uh, in a lot of ways to ensuring that labor isn't precarious or contingent, right? So if you do get hurt at the end of your second year, you won't have your contract revoked. And I do think that's a, that is a step in the right direction. I don't think it goes um, – far enough. I think that in a lot of ways, it doesn't challenge the student-athlete paradigm, which of course, as Mm -hmm. we discussed yesterday, is a legal construction that was generated by the NCAA in the the, the mid to late 1950s to ensure that um, the organization would not have to pay workers' comp um, to injured or, uh, you know, sadly to say, uh, deceased players. One thing that I find interesting about you, Chris, is obviously, you know, we're a small college up here in Maine, but you have a, a great relationship with a star NFL player in, in Colin Kaepernick, and you were just recently in New York City with uh, Colin Kaepernick. How did that relationship develop? It's developed over the course of many months. Um, it, it started, um, it actually started on social media, on Twitter. Um, my good friend, Amir, um, with whom I went to, to graduate school at UC Berkeley, has known Colin for quite some time, um, and Amir um, would retweet many of my tweets um, on black politics, African American history, um, radical traditions in education, which prioritize race, and Colin would retweet those. Um, and eventually, he, you know, he began began following me, um, and we, you know, we got in touch. Um, so yeah, he's been a he's been a, a a great ally to the larger cause of pushing back against injustice. And I was very happy to um, to be invited down to uh, the camp in, in in Harlem over the weekend, which I I should also mention was particularly resonant because the camp was held in the Autobahn Ballroom um, on, uh, at the corner of Broadway and 165th Street, uh, which is where Malcolm X uh, was assassinated uh, on February 21st, 1965. 
Gotcha. And then the camp, uh, the goal of the camp was what? The goal of the camp in a lot of ways is to empower um, empower youth of color with uh, resources in order to survive um, in a world that is generally quite hostile um, to their uh, existence uh, and thriving. So the form that that took throughout the, the camp and the day um, was a variety of presentations from folks speaking on stop and frisk, right, what to do if a police officer is harassing you, um, how to um, invoke your legal rights. Uh, there were also panels on college admissions and financial aid with particular attention paid to um, accessing Pell Grants. Um, there, there were uh, a couple of presentations and workshops on um, healthy eating. Um, which was also uh, inspiring. And then the, the day culminated um, when Colin essentially gifted uh, all of the campers, of which there were about 240, with a backpack, um, inside of which was uh, an Ancestry.com DNA uh, testing kit um, so that uh, youth could understand their roots, right, and where they, where they came from, uh, which is very, very powerful. Uh, in a lot of ways, the, the the young people were very excited about that. The backpack also included um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, which uh, has been very influential in Collins' own uh, political development. Gotcha. Interesting. So, I mean, obviously you're recovering right now from a very busy weekend, uh, Martin Luther King Day as well on Monday. I know you're a little under the weather, but what's what's next for you when you're we're back at full strength? I know you, as an activist, the work never stops, right? The work never stops. Um, the work never stops. Uh, I you know I think the next the next um, the next uh, order of operations is to get the to get the next camp running, um, mm -hmm. which hopefully you know folk will be able to do within a couple of months. Um, in another major U.S. city, um, and then um, continuing to um, work very hard um, at Bates, Bates College, along with students, faculty, and staff, to provide um, the sort of cultural programming that's needed uh, in these these spaces of, of higher education. So, um, looking forward looking forward to that, and particularly excited, I have to say, about um, the uh, recent. Uh, program that we at the Office of Equity and Diversity initiated called the Justice and Equity Reading Group, which more or less meets every other Wednesday um, in the Office of Intercultural Education in Chase Hall. We select a, you know, generally a very short essay or a short passage um, related to equity uh, and justice, uh, and we all meet. Uh, to discuss it, uh, to ask thought-provoking questions, and to really get into a thought space where we can continue to move forward the mission of the college uh, as pertains to uh, questions of deep justice in higher education and beyond. Um, it's been very well attended uh, over the per first couple of weeks, so we're excited to, to move forward. We actually meet tomorrow at 12 noon and we'll be discussing uh, Tenehisi Coates' uh, The Case for Reparations, which is an article in the uh, an article that was featured a few years ago in the Atlantic magazine. Sure, absolutely. Well, Chris, thanks so much for taking the time to join us here on the Bobcast, and thanks again for moderating uh, the panel there on MLK Day about uh, bending the arc of athletics towards justice. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Next time on the Bates Bobcast, we'll get you all caught up with the skiing seasons. The Bobcats Nordic and Alpine skiing teams debut this weekend at the St. Lawrence Carnival. The Bobcats indoor track and field teams host the Bates Invitational, and the men's basketball team has two more home games this weekend. Women's basketball remains on the road, and the squash teams visit Amherst to take on Franklin and Marshall, as well as the host, Purple and White. We'll recap it all next time on the Bates Bobcast. <laughs> Bye.